first I thought, I knew I had something. And then when I found out, that was kind of devastating, but I thought everybody has something and it could be a lot worse. And the only thing I thought is I don't want people to feel sorry for me. It was one of my first ever big diseases where you have to assume that um, uh, so, something bad is going to happen, something big is going to, and negative is going to happen in, in your life. And uh, there were times, I think, when both of us were kind of hopeless. Um, this, was, this was before we learned there are things you can do about Parkinson's disease. And, um, uh, so it, it was kind of a, it was kind of a hard time. I've got to say, I've got to add that I was really devastated, devastated. I, I felt despair. This point was too uh, soft of a word. Uh, when I found out from the uh, first physician that I went to see that he was suspecting Parkinson's, uh, my wife and I uh, shared a couple of tears and, and hugged each other. And, and uh, um, then we started looking at what we needed to do at that point. Parkinson's disease is a progressive uh, neurological disorder. Um, it typically happens um, or occurs in older individuals, but it can occur in younger individuals. Um, and the younger individuals, they call that um, early onset. But for the most part, it's um, people 65 and older that uh, tend to begin to show symptoms. First and foremost, I would say each individual is unique and each presentation is different. Um, and the trajectory of the disease is also different. Um, but typical motor symptoms we see are the slowness of movement, the shuffling of gait, um, the freezing of gait, um, even motor um, facial fe features such as um, we call it a mask face. Um, so it's, it's seemingly lack of emotion, lack of facial expression, um, kind of that expressionless facial feature. Even though the emotion is there, it's just not expressed very well through the face. I still do a little shuffling of my feet and when I'm not thinking about it, but I can, can uh, walk more um, with less shuffling uh, when I think about it. Um, I do have some trouble with my handwriting. I, I had a, a, a lot of symptoms, um, but it wasn't until I um, developed a tremor and did, did a lot of reading that um, uh, we, be, we began to suspect that. And that was about 10 years ago when I was uh, 66, uh, 65. He, he had a tremor for a long time before that, but his grandparent, his mother, his aunt, real strong family history of a familial tremor, and so it kind of threw us off track. And even when I started suspecting Parkinson's, Mark felt sure it wasn't Parkinson's because we were just assuming this tremor. In fact, his neurologist still says he does have that in addition to Parkinson's. But it wasn't until finally I brought it up to his neurologist and she had him walk down the hall and she said, well, yeah, that does look kind of like Parkinson's. The events that led up to my diagnosis, um, it was early fall of 2017. I asked Dr. Stegemoller if I could pick her brain about Parkinson's. And my dad had thought he had Parkinson's, but he had essential tremors. And we were talking and um, Dr. Stegemoller said, are we talking about you? She said, because I noticed you shuffled. The major cause is a loss of neurons in a part of the brain called the basal ganglia. And those neurons produce dopamine. And when those neurons uh, die, 
then that's when we start to begin to see some of the motor symptoms. What Dr. Stegmore refers to here is known as the leading theory behind the cause of Parkinson's. What it states is that there's an area of our brain known as the basal ganglia. Now that's responsible for our movement and our motor learning, or it plays some role in it. The basal ganglia contains brain cells that release a specific chemical called dopamine. When dopamine isn't transferred from one neurotransmitter to the other, eventually the cells stop working and they die off, and this is what causes the motor symptoms of Parkinson's, such as the tremor or the shuffling of gait, to initiate. I think I think I feel them getting more and more. If I sit down at a table and um, write a note, um, I, my right leg will shake quite a bit. Sometimes my right hand. Um, and I don't know if you notice my my right leg shakes, <laughs> but. Uh, but if I, if I focus on something like spreading my fingers or pulling my toes back or just activating some of those muscles, then the tremors go away for a little bit. They'll come back. But um, yeah, I, I think I'm noticing them more and more, but it's really not enough to interfere with anything at this time. I didn't begin with any tremors, um, and I, now I don't have any tremors, as I define, define the word. Um, I have some spasms occasionally uh, when my leg will just kind of jerk, um, but that's that's all I have as far as the the uh, incidence of tremors. I would say that I don't really think that I have tremors, at least not to the extent that they. Uh, are problematic for me. Um, I my voice uh, is not as loud as it needs to be sometimes, and uh, it's it's something that my wife will say, "Mark, I didn't catch what you said. Would you say that again?" She'll say something like that, and I, I realize that I'm creating some somewhat of an extra burden on my wife to uh, uh, require me to to uh, uh, improve my articulation and, and voice and loudness. You're gonna have to help me here, Deborah. The um, uh, dizziness, or, or, or balance, balance, balance is, is, is terrible. And- um, Balance and uh, change depth perception um, have been hard. And then add that to general weakness, just not being as strong as he was, those things have been hard. One of the things that he's developed, uh, I remember distinctly when I was first aware of his having a pretty dramatic lean like this, and it was a year ago last November, so that's quite a while ago, but he was actually leaning so far, I was afraid he was going to fall out of his chair, and one of our friends with Parkinson's had developed that lean. Otherwise, I wouldn't have recognized it as being part of Parkinson's because um, a lot of people don't get that. Some people do. And Mark wasn't even really aware of it, but he became self-conscious about it when he saw how dramatically he was leaning. But there is a whole slew of other um, impairments or symptoms with Parkinson's disease that we call non-motor or other motor symptoms like difficulty with swallowing, uh, speech, um, we, they also have difficulty with um, fatigue, uh, sleep disorders, sleep difficulties, um, um, depression, anxiety, apathy, uh, lack of motivation. So um, there's all kinds of other symptoms that come into play, which actually makes it a pretty complex um, disorder to or disease to treat. But progression would be, um, you know, the symptoms aren't that severe, like they're not infer interfering uh, too much with your with daily life. It's just like, it's a little tremor and it's kind of annoying sort of thing. Um, and it will usually be on one side of the body. Um, and then as it progresses, it will progress to both sides. 
of the body where you begin to see the motor symptoms. Um, and then as you get to the more severe will be if you need to use a walker or an assistive device. Um, the, the most severe stages, um, no longer able to move about independently and um, often um, uh, cognitive impairment becomes more severe at the end stages uh, with maybe a little bit of dementia that sets in at the very end. Giving up driving, just that about killed me. I, I've, had, I, I've had fun driving, I've had fun cars to drive. Um, Oh, I had a 1940 Chevrolet business coupe, and um, then we had a Volkswagen Square back in a fold, Volkswagen Bug for a while. Um, I had a Porsche, a Targa, and uh, I, just this last year, two years ago, I gave up my Alfa, uh, Alfa Romeo convertible. So it's, it's been fun cars. Um, and uh, I've really enjoyed it. And when I had to give up, I, I voluntarily gave up my license. I got scared of myself. They looked at driving effort and amplitude and seeing if there would be carryover to function while performing a series of exercises and selecting specific functional items to do on a repetitive basis. Um, and the theory is if you drive effort and amplitude and you drive carryover, so have them practice it every day, twice a day, two times a day for four weeks, can they have what's called, well, can they carry it over without the cueing? So if I give you five things to do, maybe I make you put your socks on big, or maybe I make you pull a chair in big, or maybe I make you put your jacket on big. At the end of the therapy, can you tell me, you know, you usually have a hard time reaching up to the cabinets, maybe because you're not reaching big enough. Can you come back and tell me, guess what, Celeste? I reached up big. Remember, we've been talking about this bigness, and I was able to reach for a cup in the higher on the higher shelf of my kitchen for the first time. And so that's kind of what we want. We want them to carry over those themes within their lives without us cueing them. And that's that's the LSVT big. But it was he actually initiated in speech therapy, and then physical therapist said it, it's it's a motor thing because speech was basically driving the volume so getting them to be as loud as they can um, and they said hey if it worked in speech it sure, sure can work with physical therapy because it's a motor function and it did well I, I think um, I think I've done quite a few things we've done quite a few things um, uh, and one part of that message about using lots of things, that means there is no single best thing. And uh, um, there are things that we've done that um, I think have, have made the, the disease more tolerable. Um, one, uh, Deborah started out early reading everything she could find. It was, um, that involved the symptoms that I, that I was having. And so knowledge, knowledge helped. Um, in another sort of category, uh, a, a big thing that helped is um, we found ourselves, uh, as we came to know more and more about um, uh, Parkinson's disease, is that um, we sort of changed community. Uh, people that had Parkinson's disease had one thing to offer us that we couldn't get any place else, and that was sort of a um, perso uh, personal vision of, uh, of, of the, the disease. Um, each of us had different symptoms, but all of us were going through a process of a, having to change our life 
because the disease wouldn't let us do what we were used to? Oh, just having that friendship and, you know, being able to do things together, whether it's paddle boarding, walking, um, cross country skiing, anything like that. Well, actually, the only people that have Parkinson's that we have really met are the ones that have been in the outreach program. It's, it's certainly probably considered to be a, a subjective uh, assessment, but I think that that uh, even if it hadn't, uh, even if my activities had not uh, resulted in any kind of, of uh, change in the physical nature of my, my body, I guess you could say, uh, even if that had occurred, certainly the attitude and the, the uh, positive uh, aspects of those classes has been a very, very promising uh, um, thing in, in, in my life as I go forward as a, a diagnosed Parkinson's patient. All of the participants are talking about an outreach group run by Dr. Elizabeth Stegmore. These outreach groups consist of dance uh, and music exercise, they do singing, they do boxing, and they do yoga. They all treat different, um, are targeted towards different symptoms. So if we look at yoga, uh, we look at relaxation is a big one, uh, reducing stress. Um, but also uh, some of the things that are inherent are the stretching capacity to help with um, rigidity, so stretching for rigidity, um, and then also a lot of people maybe don't think about this, but learning how to get down on the floor and get back up off the floor safely, bending over and standing up, um, a lot of those things maybe seem not so challenging, but um, can be for a person with Parkinson's disease, and so being able to actually practice those in a safe environment like doing yoga um, is also very beneficial. Um, for boxing, um, those would be really focused on um, a couple different things. Uh, one would be force, so in making really big movements, uh, fast and forceful movements um, when you do the punches and the, and the hitting. Uh, we do a little bit on footwork as well when we're in person. Um, and also there's actually a cognitive component to it because there are about 12 different punches in boxing um, and you have to know um, if they call an order out, you have to think fast and think about movement sequencing and what those are. Um, and the challenges, you know, balance um, and force and cognition all at the same time. Um, and then dancing is going to be uh, a little bit different, really working on movement sequencing um, and it's uh, one, uh, ta uh, one type of activity where you move backwards quite a bit and move to the side more than you would for like boxing or any other physical activity which is actually very good because um, a lot of people with Parkinson's disease are afraid of doing some of those movements because they don't want to fall. Um, in this case when you're dancing with a partner you have somebody there to support you and you can still work on those uh, backwards movements, you can work on turning, uh, moving to the side, and then again it's a whole uh, movement sequencing where you're learning new movements, new uh, sequences of movements, which is also very good. And this is all on top of the standard uh, benefits that you get from exercise um, with endurance and strength that would build. And then finally there is singing, um, which is my personal favorite, <laughs> my personal favorite group. Um, and this one uh, you know, it's been interesting because when we first started, we, we did the study and it showed that it improved respiratory control and swallow, uh, muscle activity associated with swallow, it can also help improve the voice, which are things that you would expect with singing. Uh, but when we ask participants and we do quality of life, we also see that participants really enjoy the singing and they feel less stressed, they feel like they have a better quality of life after singing. And then finally, in some of our more recent studies, um, we're trying to look under the underlying mechanism, but what's been interesting is that we, will, we looked at other motor symptoms, and there were uh, significant improvements in some of these other motor symptoms um, just from sitting and singing. So um, people 
their trimmer was better. I, I don't know how to explain any of that. That's something that we're looking at and hopefully we'll get a grant to explore a little bit more. Uh, but we, we seem, it seems that just sitting and singing can do more than, um, than what you might expect. I just say keep moving, um, find ways that uh, will help reduce the tremors. Um, I find by doing yoga or even boxing, because I'm engaging my muscles, I don't experience the tremors as much. The, the community came about through our awareness that exercise is literally the only thing you can do. Uh, you can take medications for symptom control, but literally the only thing that is absolutely known to help is exercise. So you kind of want to stay ahead of things. Um, usually when people get their diagnosis of Parkinson's, there's a lot of changes that have occurred within the brain, as you probably know. And so getting ahead of things, so making sure that you get a physical therapist consult, get some education, know what your community resources are. So know if there's a support group, know what exercise classes there are in, in the community, know the impact of your diet on your medications, um, know the different side effects of Parkinson's. There's so many things that are impacted by Parkinson's that has nothing to do with PT. So how is your digestive system affected? How is your sleep affected you know people a lot of people have components of depression with Parkinson's sleep disturbances so really trying to be as informed as you can so you can appropriately manage things and and know what's coming from the disease process but I think just going to um, websites like the Parkinson's foundation is a good good place to start to kind of know how to navigate through it my advice first the first thing I would tell them it's not the end of the world um, and that life will go on. Um, it will be different, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be worse. Um, it could be the same or it could actually be better. Um, and that, you know, doing a singing group or a boxing group or things like that may not be everybody's cup of tea. Um, and so, you know, if you can find a support community, um, that would be wonderful. And however that support is there for you, that is what I would recommend. Whether it be just your family is super supportive and you enjoy spending time with them, or you meet with your grandchildren, you go for bike rides, or you try to stay active. Um, but, or if it's joining an official outreach group or exercise group, um, whatever um, you feel comfortable with. Um, but some sort of uh, community that promotes physical activity in one way or another would be my number one recommendation uh, for something to do. Um, but my advice would be that it's, it's okay and it's your life, it's a big change and everyone totally understands that. And, and, um, but we also know that we can keep going and it can be fun, it can be positive. Um, and, and you can still meet some new people, wonderful people, and still have some wonderful experiences. Uh, for me, um, one of the, the biggest helps in dealing with this disease has been uh, um, the ability, in spite of the pain uh, in spite of the uh, or despite the um, embarrassment all this kind of uh, negative stuff is that there are people in that community that taught me how to laugh about it how, how to sit with it and not let it scare me every day is different and uh, you don't need to necessarily uh, think that you're um, your day is going to be a negative one. Um, if you can look for the small things, that's pretty much a cliche, but look for the small things and recognize that, that um, your family and uh, your friends are, are vital to keeping uh, positive about your situation. And, and they, they will, um, they will. 
support positive, that person, be positive. Be positive. Yeah. You know, I, you, you can read all about it, but not everybody progresses the same way. And it, I haven't, I did. It before. affects everybody differently. Right. And it's a long-term thing, so you, you don't freak out because, you know, instantly something's gonna happen. You know, you really have to think of the long, long term. Instead of worrying about right now, you know, you do what you can as long as you can. It's like you're saying disease. I know you're gonna win in the end. You know, I, I know you're in, incurable, but in the meantime, I'm gonna you know, have a good time, and if I'm a little bit insolent when I speak about you, disease, um, you know, that's the way it's going to be. You know, like I said, everybody has something. Um, yeah. <laughs> you know, I have Parkinson's. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, and she's healthier than I am. Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> When I first started this project, it was always about telling the stories of these people. These people that I'd gotten very close with over the last couple of years, and I really just wanted to show how the diseases affected their lives. But slowly it turned into something so much more than that. It turned into their fight. It turned into their struggle. It turned into them showing me that the most amazing part of life is how we're able to fight through the hurdles it throws at us. And the fight is what this project really tries to exemplify. The fight that they've had to go through and the fight that they've inspired all of us to go through as well. Fate whispers to the warrior, you can't handle the storm. The warrior whispers back, I am the storm. We, we are, are the, the storm. storm. We are the storm. The warrior whispers back, I am. <laughs>